So welcome everyone. It's 1.02 p.m. So we're going to get started. My name is Emmy and I am your moderator. Welcome back to Learn at Home, which is our virtual programming that where we offer videos, activities, and live lessons to keep you engaged with Tree People's work and mission, as well as provide valuable information relevant to each and every one of us as we work to find nature-based solutions to the daunting environmental challenges in our current world today. Learn at Home was launched back in March as a way to continue engaging with our sponsors, our, so our supporters, and, our, and the general public virtually. And we've all been through a lot this year and we've all come a long way. So if you've been following us from the very beginning, thank you so much. If you're new today and joining us for the first time, I'm so glad you could join us and thank you. For future live lessons, don't forget to sign up for a newsletter on our website and follow us on social media. We're on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. So Learn at Home is made possible thanks to generous donor support, including seed funding provided by the Gene Senator Legacy Fund. We also want to say a big thank you to Subaru of, of Sherman Oaks for supporting Learn at Home. And today we have a special sponsor here to make a remark and Cindy is here to introduce them. I'd like to introduce Tree People's CEO, Cindy Montañez. Okay, well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, so again, I'm Cindy Montañez and I am CEO of Tree People. Uh, thank you for joining our live lesson today on chaparral fires, um, the ecology and uh, future. Um, so Dr. John Keeley, um, fire ecologist with the US Geological Survey, um, and also a professor at UCLA is going to be providing what you will see uh, just a fascinating um, just presentation. I think we are all just experiencing um, and seeing this just heartbreaking damage with the devastating fires um, that are burning up California. And we today ex experience this extreme heat uh, with temperatures over 100 degrees um, in areas like Los Angeles, where we are currently located. I um, mean, I just have to say that um, more than ever, it's gonna be cooperation, um, global cooperation, innovation, technological advances, research policy changes between our public agencies, um, people and the business community that are really gonna help make the world a better place and help us address some of these like just critical threats that we are facing because of the changing climate. And we just want to thank one of our uh, one of our strongest supporters, um, Boeing, who is sponsoring our live lesson today, um, for tr truly um, being one of our just critical sponsors as we as, as tree people try to address some of these threats that we see um, with wildfires, with not a, not enough tree canopy coverage in communities, extending our programs to uh, educate more kids in our public schools and. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Boeing. I mean, you are really amongst the world's greatest innovators and we are proud of the partnership that we have with you because you are constantly teaching us and, and showing us to dream even bigger, especially in challenging times, to innovate more um, and to really show that, yes, we can uh, make the world a better place. Um, so everybody knows, I mean, Boeing has been a partner with Tree People that goes back um, to the 1984 Olympics in Los Angeles. And uh, it was community, um, the Boeing uh, community fund. So employees of, of Boeing that said, we want tree people and Boeing to be partners for the long run. And here we are um, after those many years, um, Boeing has stood up and invested in tree people's efforts on our eco tours, which are these wonderful programs, you know, uh, before COVID where we were bringing up over 10,000 students um, to learn about healthy forest and clean water and environmental protection and these really just fun award-winning um, eco tours in our beautiful over 400 acre park um, in the heart of Los Angeles. And um, back in 2007, Boeing stood up after these devastating fires in our local mountains here in the San Bernardino mountains and invested a significant gift um, that allowed us to plant over 60,000 seedlings um, during that time. And, uh, and just recently, um, in 2018, they stood up again with a significant legacy gift to tree people that allowed us to launch what we call Forest Aid, um, a program that is leading fire restoration efforts and recovery efforts in the Angeles National Forest, um, a program that we are very proud of um, that has engaged 
many hundreds, if not thousands of volunteers um, since we were able to launch it with Boeing. So I'm just very proud. Um, all of us tree feel really proud of this partnership that we've had with, with Boeing. And it's just great um, to have one of our strongest allies there, um, Steve Sestag from Boeing, a sponsor of today, just be with us today and give us a, a couple comments. So with that, I'd like to introduce Steve. And, and Steve, thank you. Um, you. I'm not sure if you're in Seattle right now, but um, thank you for being a partner uh, with us um, wherever you are. And we just deeply appreciate you. And I'd love to give you a few minutes to, to, to just say a couple of remarks. Uh oh, there we go. Can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you. All right, good deal. Cindy, thank you so much for the uh, wonderful remarks and it's great to see you. Thank you so much for, for having us. Um, you know, Boeing is such a proud, uh, I wanna say partner with, with three people and, and for very many, many years, as you just mentioned, and it's a thrill for me to be here today and, and great to see you and, and the rest of your team. And um, you know, my, my association with tree people goes back to when I was a young teenager growing seedlings to, to help tree people in its earliest days of its organization. So big fan and, uh, and, and just so excited to be here. Um, so my name is Steve Shestag. Uh, as Cindy mentioned, I actually am in Seattle now, a long time California, but moved up here to Seattle recent years here to help get our uh, environmental sustainability and sustainability program set up across the, the Boeing Corporation. Um, and uh, it's great to be on the phone with, uh, with our friends from Southern California and, and around the world. Um, and I didn't know you were doing these learning sessions, Cindy, so it's really cool to, to hear about the, the Chaparral Fire learning sessions. Um, you know, as you guys are well aware, California and other locations here in the West Coast continue to experiencing just devastating fires that are negative affecting, you know, businesses, uh, for Boeing, our supply chain, as well as our business, and, and, and most importantly, communities. And, you know, the neighborhood that I lived in in Ventura for, you know, 25 plus years was just devastated by the, the Thomas fire uh, recently. So um, my, my heart goes out and I really feel for one that's being affected by that. And it's interesting being up here in Washington state, right? I mean, we've had some tremendous fires here in eastern Washington here uh, earlier this summer. Um, it, uh, you know, as you can imagine here in the Northwest, a lot of families in the, that I work with are from Oregon and for the first time they're experiencing terrible devastation in, in recent years. So, you know, this really is something that we need to be concerned about throughout the, the whole West Coast. Um, and I appreciate the good work that Tree People is doing to help uh, educate and make our forests more resilient. Um, you know, we were really proud, Cindy, to be part of the, the kickoff for the Forest Aid uh, program a couple of years ago. We're really thinking about, you know, how to, to, how to fight the next you know, forest fire differently by, by fighting them before they start through restoring healthier and more resilient forests uh, that are less prone to, to burning dangerously out of control. Um, and obviously, this is particularly important, not only at the urban wildlife uh, or, excuse me, urban wildland interface, but also as we're experiencing, right, I mean, the, just the smoke and the air quality that affects whole regions is, you know, now something that we've got to be increasingly concerned about. So, you know, being able to act fast to restore fat forests in the right manner so that we can better protect ourselves and our communities and our environments is, is just tremendously important and, and, uh, and, and appreciate the work that you're doing. You know, we understood the need for uh, continued involvement in both humanitarian and, and environmental crises that are caused by wildfires, excuse me, wildfires. Uh, just two weeks ago, Boeing uh, announced $700,000 in grants to support local communities impacted by wildfires burning along the West Coast. Uh, we're providing $500,000 to the American Red Cross to support its fire relief efforts in Washington, in Oregon, and in California. And then the remaining $200,000 is going to help food banks to support families, friends, and neighbors that have been displaced. And, you know, just like these donations, um, many, many organizations, not just Boeing, are continuing to give year after year to this cause. We, we need to figure out how we can act and partner not only to provide relief, but help address the, you know, the root cause of the problem, if you will, through innovative solutions like uh, 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 the reforestation efforts. So, you know, thank you, Cindy, uh, Boeing, uh, tree people, everyone that's on this call today, we really appreciate what you're doing to learn about and help restore 
healthier and more resilient for us to prevent wildfires. And back to you, Cindy. Thank you, Steve. Um, and you, um, you know, you have really empowered us at, at a time when we most needed the support um, to go out and organize communities um, to do this type of restoration work and, and take care of our forest and our local mountains. So again, a very a, a deep appreciation. So, um, so now we're going to hear from our speaker. Um, I think you're going to find this conversation, you know, to continue to be very just fascinating. So with that, um, I'd like to introduce uh, Dr. John Keeley, who will, who will give his, his remarks. Yes, thank you so much, Cindy. Um, so John is, uh, oh, so Dr. Keeley will share his screen. So um, I will stop my share now. Okay, is that coming through okay? Yes. Okay, um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I've uh, known about tree people ever since I moved to the LA area in 1977 as a faculty member at Occidental College. Um, I was never real big on trees because I spent most of my career studying uh, chaparral, but I have to say, uh, I've heard a number of uh, excellent talks. In fact, the one that sticks in my mind was, I think it was the Mediterranean Cities Conference that um, that Andy Lipkus gave a talk, which I thought was, I was very impressed with. So uh, I'm happy to be here. I'm gonna turn off my video, um, but you, know, you don't really wanna look at me anyways. Uh, you wanna look at the screen. And I'm going to try and talk about the, uh, whoops. I'm going to try and figure out how to do this. <laughs> I'm trying to figure out how to turn off my video. Of course, I've turned, put on my reading glasses. Okay, I think we're set now. Um, Basically, uh, what I'm going to try and do is a lot in uh, the amount of time, and that is to try and give you some idea about chaparral fires and how chaparral fires uh, impact the ecosystem. But I, I'd like to look at it more broadly. Uh, tree people, of course, is interested in trees. We're all interested in what happens throughout the state, and a lot of the state is dominated by forests. Uh, so I'm going to give a broad overview of the ecology of forest and chaparral and how fire impacts those systems. And then what's on everybody's mind is 2020 and what's uh, going on at the present time and what we might see for the future. Now, to begin with, um, the uh, image here, uh, if you've lived in Southern California very long, you recognize this is a typical autumn day uh in, in southern california and these sorts of scenes this is actually from i think the old fire uh about 15 years ago but one of the uh humorous parts of all of this is the onion and the onion declaring that every year californians gather to celebrate the annual wildfire tradition because it is an annual uh situations uh and uh that's one of the things that makes California unique is that it's an, an annual event. Uh, it almost an annual event in terms of fires. Now, the, what captures everybody's attention these days is if you look at the statistics, over the uh, last 20 years, we've had 13 million acres burned from wildfires in California. Uh, although this slide was made up before this year began, so we're probably looking at 16 million now. Uh, but it's double the average we saw in the prior 20 uh, years. One of the things that is particularly important to address is what drives this change in increased fire. Climatologists claim this is a result of climate change and this is the new normal. We need to get uh, used to it. Uh, fire science to try and get into some of the complications. Sort of questions that I'd like to address is, are these fires uh, that we're seeing, are they ecological uh, disasters? And, and in order to understand that, California is a very diverse state from the border uh, with Mexico up to Oregon, 
uh, we're talking about a landscape that has the same latitudinal range as, as from southern New Mexico up into Wyoming. So we have a, a vast diversity of landscapes and very different types of fires uh, and very different population levels. For example, there's about 10 times more people in the southern half of the state than the northern half of the state. Um, the vegetation is very different. Most of the northern part of the state is dominated by conifer forests, whereas the southern part of the state is often chaparral or grasslands. But also what's particularly important is fires are very different in these landscapes. There's about an order of magnitude, a uh, number of fires per million hectares of landscape uh, in Southern California relative to Northern California. And in Northern California, a lot of these are natural lightning ignited fires. Southern California, 99% <clears throat> are caused by people. So very different fire situations. In short, the blue color represent national fires that uh, have missed fires relative to what we believe their historical fire uh, regime was. In other words, we have been very good at putting fires out in these Northern California and Sierra Nevada forests. The yellows and orange here are forests in the southern part of the state, and those colors represent areas that have actually had an excess of fires in the last um, hundred years. So very different types of situations. Now what drives this? Um, we uh, have to recognize that the northern part of the state, which is dominated by forests, has a very different fire regime historically than Southern California. They have what is commonly referred to as the surface fire regime or in mixed conifer forests, where fires historically burned here in the understory and took out the dead uh, leaves and branches, but generally, uh, except for small patches, didn't consume the entire canopy. Very different than Southern California in your chaparral. We have never had a surface fire regime. Fires here always are uh, high intensity crown fires that take out the entire canopy. Now in forests, when we have this low intensity surface fire, it's lethal to seedlings in the understory. And as a result, reproduction of trees in our forests is dependent on small gaps where there's been high intensity burning, there's been an opening, and then the trees around that gap will deposit seeds uh, into the gap and then you have recruitment of new trees. So reproduction is dependent on a, a mosaic pattern of small patches of high intensity uh, in a landscape of mostly low intensity. Now, in the last hundred years, state and federal agencies have uh, done a lot of work on trying to eliminate fires. And in fact, for the early part of the uh, uh, 20th century, it was a large debate in the literature uh, about should we be trying to put out fires in our forests or should we let them record of what historically fire was like in these forests. This is a tree here in one of our Sierra Nevada forests. You see this scar, which is the result of a low intensity surface fire. If you take a cross section through that uh, stem and look at the uh, rings on that. This is the outer part of the stem. This is the scar here. What you can determine is what the past fire history has been. And these are all previous scars that have healed over. And what we know is that here's uh, was an interval, fire interval in that landscape. But since the beginning of the 1900s, there's been essentially no fire. In other words, this is the result of state and federal agencies suppressing fires, and it's been extremely successful. One of the unfortunate outcomes of this, though, is an accumulation of fuels in the understory, and some estimates and some forests show as much as five times greater fuel accumulation in the understory relative to what we believe the historical conditions were. So in many respects, this solution of trying to suppress fires was really creating a problem. Or uh, as Eric Severide, a 1960s newscaster, used to say, the, uh, the uh, one thing to understand about most problems is they begin as solutions. And this is an illustration of a problem that began as a solution. Here's one of the outcomes 
comes. This is a fire in a contemporary forested landscape, mostly ponderosa pine. The foreground here represents a forest that burned more or less in what we believe is fires uh, with occasional flare-ups, burning gaps in the canopy, uh, which were important for recruitment sites. But most this in this scene, we have vast amounts of the landscape that were burned in crown fires. The entire forest was taken out. And this represents an extreme condition which these forests are not gonna readily recover from because in order to uh, uh, disperse seeds into this landscape, naturally it probably we're talking about a century or more. So we've created a lot of problems by doing this. Now, we would like our forest to return to a natural condition like this, but when you have these big crown fires, the potential is some of these forested landscapes will return to shrublands, some will return to grasslands, and so we've really upset what we believe the natural balance is. So one of the things to understand about fires in these forests is human perturbations of the fire regime by reducing natural fires uh, has the potential for leading to ecological disasters. Now, shrublands, on the other hand, particularly Southern California ones, are adapted to infrequent high intensity fires. And they look something like this. They take out the entire canopy. Uh, this is not an unnatural fire. This is a natural condition for fire in Chaparral. And if we look at the history of fires in Southern California, Chaparral shrublands, we don't have these tree ring studies that have been done that show fires at periodic intervals and then no more fire after fire suppression. In Southern California, all we have is written records because we don't have trees to leave records. Uh, but what we see is over the last hundred years, we've had essentially very little change in the amount of area burned. We're getting, uh, we've from the very beginning of records, we've been having vast amounts of area burn. So even though these Southern California landscapes were managed by the same policy of fire suppression, uh, managers just si simply weren't able to extinguish the fires and prevent them from burning like we saw in the, in the forest where you have this long hiatus in uh, burning. Now, what happens after fire? After fire, a lot of chaparral landscapes look like this. They look like a moonscape. Everything's been taken out. But all you have to do is return after the first or during the first spring and you see that that landscape recovers very rapidly and chaparral is extraordinarily resilient to fire um, and it recovers in a couple ways one is a lot of our species have the capacity for resprouting from the base and these are different species with resprouting capacity uh, and so they recover rapidly from resprouts but also a lot of of our shrubs, particularly Ceanothus and Arctostaphylus, have the capacity to store seeds in the soil between fires. And then when the fire comes, they those seeds are stimulated to germinate. And this is just an illustration of a five-year study where we looked at a number of obligate cedars like Ceanothus species. And this is the percentage of germination by year. As you can see, essentially all of them come up in the first year after the fire. So they are stimulated by fire to germinate. In the absence of fire, we see very little successful germination. Now, another important aspect to chaparral is you'll also see in the first spring, particularly if there's been adequate rainfall, uh, a vast array of wildflowers that come up in these burned areas. Some of these are very unique to chaparral uh, burned areas and you don't see them except after a fire. Uh, one of the questions that's long been uh, addressed in the literature is what is it that triggers the germination of these seeds after fire? Now, when I was a student, uh, I was always told, well, it was heat of the fire that stimulated germination. We now know that for probably the majority of these species that come up after fire, it's not heat at all. It's chemicals in the smoke. And this is just an illustration of patterns of germination in germination here. And these are different treatments. These are controls. We don't do anything to them. Here we've heat treated them. Here we've given them charred wood. And here we've exposed them to smoke. And you can see that for a lot of these some sort of chemical treatment from the smoke, and it's not heat at all. 
Uh, Amenanthe is probably the clearest example. No treatment at all. None of them germinate. You give them the right level of smoke and you get 100% germination. So it's clear that a lot of these post-fire species, things we call post-fire endemics, because some of them you only see after a fire, are triggered by chemicals from the smoke. And so what that tells us is chaparral is not just adapted to fire, it's fire dependent. And that tells us there's been a very long coevolution between chaparral and fire. And in fact, we have good fossil evidence that shows most all of the dominant shrubs in chaparral uh, have a very long uh, history in the fossil record going back over 50 million years. So these are shrubs that more or less in their uh, contemporary form existed for 50 million years on this landscape. And what's particularly interesting is the, these two genera here, the Manzanitas and the Ceanothus, uh, are the ones that mostly respond by producing seeds. And they are a little more recent. They uh, probably arose somewhere about 20 million years ago. And it suggests that maybe there was a climate change here uh, 20 million years ago that made the environment more Mediterranean in terms of its characteristics. Now, even though we say shrublands are fire adapted, uh, we need to appreciate that they're only adapted to a particular regime. Uh, and that regime is infrequent crown fires, uh, which are two to three decades apart. Human perturbations on these landscapes have greatly changed the fire frequency and they've la led to ecological disasters. For example, this is a site outside Alpine in San Diego County. This area, part of the uh, background here is uh, this photo was taken in 2004. The background here represents mature chaparral that recovered after the 1970 Laguna fire. The uh, foreground here, all of this foreground burned again in uh, uh, 2001 by the Viejas fire. And then the very uh, foreground here represents an area burned a third time by the Cedar fire. And what we see is a very different, great difference in the physiognomy of the vegetation. Primarily what we're seeing is mature chaparral in the background, uh, successional chaparral species here uh, in the middle part of the scene. And then this with three fires uh, and particularly fires only a couple years apart, we're seeing a totally different vegetation. These are, this is almost all brome grass, which is invaded. And so chaparral is adapted to fire, but it's not adapted to any fire regime. It has to have infrequent fires. And without that, you uh, are likely to see type conversion. And we have a lot of concern about this. This is uh, a fire map from San Diego County, 2003-2007. Uh, the green here, this represents the 2003 fire. Uh, the yellow represents a 2007 fire. What you see is a lot of overlap. In other words, a lot of that landscape, in this case, about 20,000 acres, reburned after four years. Uh, same with their fire from 2003, uh, about 27,000 acres. Reburned after an interval of just four uh, years. And then the same thing down here with the Otai and Harris fire, 18,000 acres burned after a very short interval. These inversion, where we're going to lose the native vegetation because the frequency is too high and we're likely to be invaded by chaparral. And this is a concern throughout the southern part of the state because this is an illustration of the fire return interval. Uh, departure index for the southern part of the state. And all these yellows and orange indicate these are landscapes that have received far more fire in the last hundred years than we believe historically was the case. Um, and in fact, we have through aerial uh, photographs, historical aerial photographs, we've mapped the conversion of chaparral to grasslands. All these purple areas indicate areas that uh, 70 years ago were shrublands, today are grasslands. And so when you drive up the coast uh, highway through uh, places like San Luis Obispo and you see patches of shrublands on the slopes here, these are sites that simply represent the natural vegetation. All the golden yellow colors are all invasive grasses represent the result of perturbations of too much fire. And you can see this in other examples. Here's a scene from 
uh, uh, Santa Monica Mountains. This is what the Santa Monica Mountains normally looks like when it's gone without fire for 30 years. Here's an area that's burned three times in 12 years. And all the golden color here is all due to uh, oats and uh, brome grass, which have invaded because they, uh, the natural chaparral can't withstand three fires in 12 years. Now, let's talk about what factors can explain this 21st century rise in fires. Uh, and the uh, one thing that, that is probably most helpful in understanding this is recognize like fuels, wind, temperature, drought. But some of those factors are more important on some landscapes. And one way of envisioning this is that in uh, some of our landscapes, those fires are dominated more by fuels and in other landscapes dominated more by winds. In particular, the Sierra Nevada and forests of Northern California, due to a history of successful fire suppression, which almost borders on fire exclusion, we've had an anomalous fuel accumulation, up to five times more fuels in the understory than his historically was the case. And so, the fires in these forests are really controlled by internal factors. In other words, factors that are generated by the system itself, what ecologists would call bottom up drivers of uh, fires. Now, in contrast, when we look at the Southern part of the state, these are areas dominated by winds and they, uh, these extreme wind events, even though the landscapes have had the fire, same fire suppression policy, We've never been able to exclude fires, and we don't have an anomalous accumulation of fuels because these fires are controlled by external controls, what ecologists might call top-down controls. Here's just an illustration of some examples of fires, and these are just selected out subjectively to illustrate different types of fires, which I describe as fuel-dominated fires versus wind-dominated fires. And these are just uh, uh, about a half dozen of those fires, which are clearly affected by the fuels. And some characteristics of those fuel dominated fires, mostly they're in the Sierra Nevada and Northern California. Mostly they occur in the summer and mostly they are the result of natural lightning ignitions. Seldom do people die. And generally we don't see large losses of structures in contrast to wind dominated fires, which are mostly in the Southern part of the state. Uh, and they mostly happen in the autumn when we have these extreme Santa Ana wind events. And they almost never, or I should say never are the result of lightning ignitions. They're always due to human uh, causes. Now, if we look at uh, the history of past past fires in these fuel dominated landscapes. This is one the Northern Sierras and then the Rush Fire in the Northern Sierras. This is an outline that shows the fire perimeter and these uh, colored areas indicate past fires. The hash lines indicate no fire in the last uh, 110 years. And what you can see is in both these fires, much of that landscape just simply wasn't burned. In other words, these are fires that are largely the result of fire suppression, fuel accumulation uh, accounts for why those fires were so big. Now, it doesn't mean that these fuel dominated fires never have wind as a factor. Uh, for example, we uh, saw with the uh, fires in 2017, I believe this was the, uh, the car fire here. Uh, a lot of that landscape had never had a recorded fire. The huge fuel accumulation caused a internal wind event and it was actually almost like a tornado. It tore down a lot of dead trees. Uh, and we could see the same thing in the LA station fire 2010. Uh, there was a large patch of area in, that had not burned in a very long period of time. And when those, uh, the fire hit those, we got this uh, plume of smoke coming up due to the heavy fuels and this resulted in a collapse of that uh, plume and drove fire in 360 degrees. So it generated its own winds. But the important thing to keep in mind about winds in these fuel dominated fires is 
they are the result of heavy fuel accumulation. In other words, we could potentially control those winds by managing fuels. Now, in contrast, if we look at wind dominated fires, they're generally the result of conditions such as a high pressure cell in the Great Basin, low pressure cell off the coast. And then in Southern California, if you get an ignition during one of those winds event, wind events, these smoke plumes show that these are offshore flows of wind. They often, uh, and these are annual events, both in Southern California, as well as in the Northern part of the state. This is the fires from 2017, uh, Santa Rosa, Mendocino area. Uh, and those smoke plumes, once again, show this offshore flow from the north wind uh, events. And they're not unique to Southern California. We saw the same thing in 2016 in Gatlinburg, Tennessee, one of these foon type winds. Uh, and it resulted in a lot of deaths, 14 people died, 1600 structures destroyed. What's different about California is these wind events are annual events. In other regions, they're uh, sporadic. Now, one of the characteristics about these wind events is that they generally predominate in the autumn. This is the distribution of Santa Ana winds in Southern California, uh, seek months of Santa Ana winds. And when you overlay that on our climate diagram, this, uh, these dots here indicate our annual summer drought. So these winds occur at the end of our drought. And so they're particularly dangerous because of the timing of the wind events. Now, if we look at the same sort of fire perimeter maps that we saw for the fuel dominated fires, this is the Woolsey fire perimeter here. And what you noticed is almost the entire perimeter within that perimeter has, same with the Thomas fire. Uh, lots of landscape has burned already. Uh, so when we get these wind dominated, fires, you don't need a long to become dangerous. Uh, even prescription burns, which are represented by these blue areas here, don't seem to have any impact on halting those fire events. When you get those winds uh, blowing at the speeds they do under the conditions they burn, uh, you can blow right over any sort of younger fuel. So this is not a fuel problem number of studies and I'll just summarize some of the patterns that we've seen. If you look at forests in the Sierra Nevada, very often they are too moist and too cool to burn. And so when you look over the last 110 years of data uh, in the Sierra Nevada and you look at the uh, spring temperatures in a given year and how much area burned that year, uh, and the same with summer temperatures in the area you burn, we see a strong relationship. In other words, the hotter it is in spring and summer, the more likely that you're going to get a big fire. When you look in Southern California, we don't see any relationship at all. Uh, and we think primarily the reason is that in Southern California, it's always hot enough and dry enough for a big fire. So the annual variation in temperature isn't gonna make a big difference. And this is just an illustration. In the Sierra Nevada, summer temperatures on average around 19 degrees centigrade, uh, you get the most area burn. In Southern California, those are the lowest temperatures you ever see. So Southern California, hot enough and dry enough most years to have a big fire. Now, when we put all of the climate parameters together and try and predict the uh, amount of area burned, what we see is that in these Sierra Nevada forests, uh, they are flammability limited and that we can predict the amount of area burn by different uh, climate parameters to different degrees. This is just the last uh, half of the record here going up to uh, the near the present. What we see is, is we can explain 50% of and summer temperature. And it suggests that since we're seeing an increase in temperature, just because they are sensitive to climate on a year to year basis. In the Southern California region, we generally don't see any relationship between climate and fires uh, in our landscape. 
largely it's because these are driven by extreme winds. Um, but what's it? We can see some relationship uh, with climate, in particular, the prior year precipitation. And what prior year precipitation tells us is the following year it had a lot of fuel. And that's usually what happens in grass dominated landscapes. And what we believe is the fact that from 1919 to 1959, we saw no relationship with, with climate. But in the last 50 years, we now see prior year rain plays a later role in changing fire regimes in our Southern California. 2020, if you look up the Urban Dictionary, they now have defined people would probably use other terminology than just hell, but it's been a, a really bad year, uh, not just because of COVID-19, but this uh, fire situation. So far this year, and this slide was made uh, two weeks ago, and we now are up to 3.7 million acres burned. Uh, it surpass, surpasses any previous year by twofold. Now, climatologists claim this is due to climate change. However, fire scientists by and large know it's way more complicated than just climate change. Uh, in my view, the 2020 fire season is the perfect storm comprising the nexus of low rainfall year in the north, extraordinary lightning storm, long and intense heat wave, Fire suppression in forests has created as much as five times greater fuels. And then the long drought, which occurred from 2012 all the way to, uh, in terms of looking at each one of these individually, 50% of normal rainfall, this really applies to the northern part of the state because Southern California uh, had more or less normal rain this year. Uh, what that means is summer vegetation is just gonna have less moisture and it's gonna be easier to burn it. Uh, this massive dry lightning storm in August, we saw the, uh, from uh, Santa Cruz County North, uh, something like on the order of 5,000 fires ignited by lightning. And of course, you know, some people would speculate that this is an illustration of, of climate change impacts, but I don't think that we can necessarily conclude that quite yet. In terms of just lightning in general, we generally see that this northern part of the state, this is a distribution of different fire sources, lightning, arson, debris, equipment, vehicles, and power lines. We see the northern part of the state typically has much more lightning than the southern part of the state. This is for uh, counties and this is for forests in the state. The northern part of the state typically has more lightning, typical annual event, but it's also an, not an anomalous event. We've seen these uh, lightning storms occur about once a decade. Last one was 2008 uh, in Northern California. It started 2,000 fires, a million acres burned. We also had a big storm like this in 1999 with the same result. Granted, this one was more severe, but the bottom line is we get these uh, lightning storms about once a decade. Uh, the other factor in the 2020 perfect storm is we had a long and very intense heat wave, and this is increases flammability of vegetation. It occurred throughout the southwestern U.S. It was very similar to the heat wave we saw in uh, January of this year in Australia that resulted in massive fires, high, high temperature records uh, broken. The other factor that we need to keep in mind is we've had fire suppression in forests created much greater fuel levels and uh, fire suppression related fuels and resulted in much more fuel accumulation. And here's an illustration of the 2020 fire from Santa Cruz. And once again, uh, here's a prior fire here and here, but the vast majority of that Santa Cruz complex uh, had never had a fire in the past due to the fire suppression. So 
the bottom line is that we're dealing with really high fuel accumulation from fire suppression. And then lastly, there was this long drought from 2012 to 2017 in different parts of the state. Um, and here's an illustration of how severe the drought was in different parts of the state. The middle line here is uh, anything above the line represents a year where there was higher than uh, the normal uh, amount of precipitation or moisture and below the line indicates droughts. And what we see is beginning about 2012, the blue represents the <coughs> central part of the state, Sacramento Basin. We saw a lot of uh, very dry years extending all the way up to about 2015 and 2016 it broke. Uh, Southern California, it just continued on and on and on uh, up until about 2018. So we've had this very severe drought and that drought has resulted in a massive dieback, even greater increase on fuels. This is a picture outside my back uh, door uh, looking at Case Mountain and this is in 2016 and all that brown represents dead uh, ponderosa pine. So the drought caused severe dieback, greatly increasing the fuel loads, almost certainly contributing to the fires that we're seeing now. Now, one of the problems with understanding the factors driving this dieback is climatologists point to the fact that climates are getting warmer and that's a major driver. But we also need to keep in mind management practices played a role because this is what the fire regime looked like in this scene right here. Uh, there were frequent fires up until about 1900, and that likely thinned out the forest. Then in the last, we're seeing a great increase in density of trees, which almost certainly increased the competition for water and increased propensity for uh, dieback. So it's a complicated problem, involves uh, climate change and as well as past management practices. And this was one of the outcomes um, this is the dark red indicate drought and we see the Sierra suffered a huge amount of dieback and these are also landscapes that had massive fires this year twice although we don't have trees we have chaparral and all of this gray represents dead chaparral taken in 2016 and this likely uh, greatly increase the uh, flammability of these landscapes. And in fact, recently we've done a, a measure of the amount of dieback from the Woolsey fire perimeter. This is the Woolsey perimeter here. Uh, and the uh, reds and orange represent our estimate of the amount of dieback uh, due to uh, the fires. And so there's uh, certainly reason to believe that that dieback contributed to the size of the Woolsey fire. Now, when we think about the 2020 fire season, we have to realize it's only just begun. And the, uh, in fact, if we look at area burned in Southern California, uh, we see that the month of October is a peak in terms of more uh, fires. But one of the things to keep in mind about these uh, autumn fires, which are driven by Santa Ana wind events. And this is just a percentage of Santa Ana wind events on this axis here. And the amount of area burned is about 70% of all our Santa Ana wind events have no fire at all. So it's not the wind per se that starts the fire. It's somebody lighting a fire during a Santa Ana wind event. And the blues represent here the first uh, 36 years of our record from 1948 to 1983. The red indicates from 1984 to 2018. What we see is there's been a big shift in the factors driving these fires. Uh, and they are primarily arson, but most particularly power line failures. And so these are an illustration that the real drivers of this increase in fire in our landscape is not, not so much the intensity of the winds or the predictability of Santa Ana winds. It's a coincidence of an ignition event during a Santa Ana wind event. And 
This is important to keep actors driving fires on these landscapes. Climatologists will point out that in the last 20 years, we've had almost half a degree centigrade increase in temperature, which certainly affects flammability. But uh, human ignitions are also a factor because all of our Santa Ana wind driven fires are started by people. And since the year 2000 here, we've added 6 million more people to the state. And so that almost certainly is one of the factors driving these fires. In addition, it uh, greatly increases the number of people at risk. And so one of the reasons we're seeing more homes destroyed and more people dying from these fires is we just have more people on our landscape and it's not going to get any better. 2050, it's projected that right now we're at 40 million, we're likely to be at 60 million. That means more ignitions on the landscape, more people are vulnerable to fires. And so we need to think seriously about the whole issue of fire prevention. Uh, and the uh, here's just an illustration of one of the, the uh, reasons why we need to worry about this. These two fire perimeters, the red indicates a fire near Santa Rosa, 1964 the Hanley fire, the black indicates 2017, the Tubbs fire. And 50 years apart, the 64 fire, no fatalities, almost no structures lost. 2017, we had something like 22 people die and over 5,000 structures lost. And the big factor driving this, in my view, is just population growth. We went from 30,000 people up to 170,000 people. Uh, and that greatly changes development patterns. This is uh, a outline of the 1964 Hanley fire, very little development within it. This is the 2017 Tubbs fire. Uh, at least half that landscape had low density housing. And that not only increases people at risk, but it also increases the ignition potential. In particular, most of these 2017 fires in the North Bay area were started by power lines you increase the density of population uh, and you're likely to increase the potential for power line failures. And in fact, in the years from 2000 uh, to 2018, the uh, power line ignited fires changed tremendously. This is uh, in 1981 to 99, 112,000 acres uh, in uh, 20 to 2000 to 2018, we had 500,000, a five-fold increase in power line ignited fires. And certainly population growth is a major driver. So I would just end with this. And that is when we're talking about Southern California chaparral fires, uh, there are really five Ps to how we deal with uh, the managing these landscapes. Number one, we have to recognize this is a people problem. And we need to not think about fuels. We need to think about the people on the landscape and what they're contributing to these fires. Prevention is going to be far more critical than fuel treatments. We need to think about planning communities, protecting homes in particular, uh, hardening our houses, and then finally prediction of what those winds are going to do when they begin. Because when some of these fires start, if we had good models predicting where the winds were going to go and how fast they would reach an area, and we had good communication with agencies and homeowners, we could save a lot of lives. So I'll just conclude there. Thank you so much, Dr. Keeley. That was an extremely insightful educational presentation. We do have a lot of questions um, in the respect of time. However, I don't think we can get to all of them. We have five minutes left for Q&A, so I'm just going to go in order. Our first question we have in the chat is from Heather. She asks, I know there was a move away from post-fire seeding and planting. Is there a better way to force post-fire succession? What about succession of a changing climate post-fires? Well, there's really no reason to try and uh, actively manage these landscapes by seeding anything. It's already been proved to be a dismal failure and has in fact contributed to massive invasive problems. The earliest uh, attempt to reseed after fire was reseeding with mustard. Mustard is now one of our major invasive problems in Southern California uh, because of the introduction of it as a seeding project. So there really is nothing that we can do in terms of speeding up succession. What we can do though is we can do more 
to uh, reduction and debris flows on communities. Wow, I did not know that about black mustard. Great to know. Um, we have another question from Edith. Considering Cyanothus and Manzanita tell the story of when our regions shifted into a Mediterranean climate in the past, do we see any evidence that we may be shifting, we may be in a shifting climate epoch again now? Should we expect to shift out of a Mediterranean temperature precipitation regime in a shift in vegetation accordingly? Yeah, there's no uh, climate evidence from any of the models that suggests that we're going to be seeing radical changes in, in our climate. We're going to see shifts in timing of droughts. We're going to see shifts in uh, timing of winds, but there's no evidence at this point in the foreseeable future we're going to move out of a Mediterranean climate. Thank you for that answer. And then we have a question from Judy who asks, isn't rainfall and prolonged heat also related to climate change and extraordinary wind events? And I believe she's referring to when you mentioned that there's no evidence for climate change induced um, fire frequency. Well, there's certainly no question. Climate change has the, has the potential for impacting fires in all parts of the state. Where it's clearest is in the forest. And we have good reason to believe climate change will change fire regimes in forested landscapes. In Southern California, the evidence isn't at all clear that climate change is going to greatly alter what happens, primarily because this is a landscape that is really dominated by people and they are probably having direct impacts far greater than climate change. For example, recent studies have shown that their climate change is likely to increase the intensity of Santa Ana winds. Uh, but the bottom line is the intensity of the wind has no relationship for whether or not there's a fire. It depends on whether people start fires. 50% of the time when we have extreme wind events, we have no fire at all. And so probably a bigger factor is going to be uh, whether or not humans ignite a fire during that uh, condition. Now, it means that it is not the major driver. I see. Thank you for that answer. We have another question from Heather. Has there been a correlation with shot hole borer and other tree killing pests with the amount of dead and dry vegetation? Yeah, I think you'd need to talk to an entomologist. I don't really know enough to speak about that. All right, and then there's a question. There is no such thing as a stupid question. All questions are great. Um, when you say fuel, are those several different things or just fuel? I'm not sure what the question refers to. By fuel, <clears throat> we mean biomass that contributes to burning and generally, uh, when we talk about fuel loads, we're talking about dead fuels because the dead fuels are critical in terms of carrying a fire simply because green foliage uh, generally beneath the green fuels uh, heated up to drive off moisture and then it will ignite. So generally when we talk about fuels, we're talking about dead vegetation. All right, well, I think um, we're gonna have one more question. And I'm seeing a question from Jess, which is a great question for closing, I think. So I'm going to ask this question. Is the, if the main reason for fire is increased population and power lines, what is the alternative to this? What is the solution to this? Especially a solution that incorporates aff affordable, safe, potentially sunflower housing for the populations. Well, in my mind, the importance of recognizing that uh, certainly in terms of our worst fires in coastal California, and this does not apply to Sierra Nevada forest, but in coastal California, when we recognize people and population growth are a major factor in driving our fires, it's a much more positive uh, view of the future because it tells us we can actually do something about it. Uh, there are climatologists that have been quoted in the media uh, saying that it's all about climate change. This is the new normal and it's only going to get worse because the climate's only going to get worse. To me, that's a very pessimistic view of fires. Uh, we have the capacity 
to change ignition sources, in particular power lines. There's a lot we can do about reducing power line ignited fires. To me, that's a positive message for the future. We can change outcomes Are you still there, Dr. Keeley? I'm still here. Did, okay. uh, I, did you lose me? Uh, just for a second, yeah. Okay. But thank you for that. So that was pretty much the end of what I had to say on that. I think that's a really great, you know, positive note to end on. Thank you so much for being here today and giving us this amazing information. I think you basically, you know, were able to explain what we've all been, you know, bombarded with in the media and just seeing it in real life. And, and now I at least have a, you know, different perspective to fires and, and a lot more awareness around fires. So this was very, very informative. Thank you so much. And I apologize that we couldn't get to all of the questions, but I, we, we really appreciate the engagement. Um, Please follow tree of uh, please follow tree people. You can sign up to our newsletter for future for future live lessons and follow us on social media in order to see what we're offering through Luna through Luna through Learn at Home and our educational content. Again, thank you so much, Dr. Keeley, for being with us today. Really, really appreciate it. And yes, everybody is is so thankful in the chat. Let me let me just make one last what, let me make one last comment here, and that yeah. is uh, for questions that we didn't get to. I'm more than happy to answer them if you want to email me those questions. If you just Google my name and USGS, you'll find my email. That is great. Thank you so much. I'm actually, we're going to send, a, in case you missed it, follow-up email. And would it be okay if we included your email address in that email so people can easily contact you? Yes, that would be fine. Awesome, thank you so much. Well, have a great rest of your Thursday, everybody. And thank you again, Dr. Keeley. My pleasure, bye. Bye.